I'm coming to realize that uh, something really wonderful is the is the blessed hope of heaven and what we have to look forward to. We've got a lot to look forward to. And so uh, uh, it's good to remind ourselves when life gets rough or throws us a curve or somebody we love is in a in a hard place to remind ourselves of what what we're headed towards and that indeed every single day really does bring us one step closer uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and in that we can always rejoice it's a beautiful blessed hope that we have so uh, please open your Bibles then to Isaiah chapter 11 Isaiah 11 tonight I don't have a long message but uh, I've said that before and absolutely lied, so. <laughs> but, uh, but let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I, <clears throat> I thank you for Isaiah chapter 11. I thank you that you're with us. Lord, I'm thrilled at the number of youth that we now have in the youth group and, and how excited and, and they are amped, Lord. So uh, keep on blessing that group, Lord, and bring more youth. Uh, we would love that, Father. Uh, we pray this, that you would be with us, Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten your word, that you would make it meaningful for our lives uh, today in the here and now. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and for giving us the opportunity to again open up your word. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. All right, like I already said, I'm very happy to be coming to this chapter because Isaiah, of course, you know, the first uh, 10 chapters are pretty pretty rough for the most part. Uh, you have God's chosen people who were taken out of slavery and out of uh, the worship of false gods. And the Lord said, I am going to totally set you up. And that's exactly what the Lord did. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Lord says, I'm going to move you into a land that you don't know. I'm going to give you houses that you didn't have to build. I'm going to give you vineyards and I'm going to give you cattle. And I'm just going to, it's going to be a land that flows with milk and honey. And this was said to and passed along to people who were slaves. You know, they were in a tough place in a crummy world. And then God says, I am totally going to set you up. And the Lord did exactly that. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, But when I do set you up, don't forget me. And guess what they did? They forgot him. I don't know if there's anything sadder in the Christian experience than for us to have received forgiveness of sins and freedom and, and uh, the presence of God even living within us and yet we sometimes forget or we take it for granted you know and we do lightly with the grace of God forgetting that he's a holy God and so when we come to a book like Isaiah God is demonstrating that he is a holy just judge and when he comes into a group of people that are absolutely rebellious, guess what he does? He does not drop the hammer on them. He pleads with them, come back, you know? God's not in the business of twisting arms to get people to serve him, I guess, as we can see in the world today. He's looking for people who will willingly come to him and willingly stay with him. Every now and then you'll hear about somebody who has a dog, you know, uh, that, that runs away. And you, you wonder why. <laughs> somebody will say, I have the most loving, sweet dog in the whole world, but boy, don't open the front door. Because they bolt. And then they're out there and they're afraid and they don't know where they are. And they some of them get run over. They get taken to the pound. Guess what? Sometimes God's people act like that. Like somebody who's been brought in out of the cold, taken care of, pampered, fed. But God opens the door a little bit, gives somebody the freedom to choose, and they bolt. And then they're out there going, where am I? What happened? You know, how can this be? 
And interestingly, God waits for people to have that realization of that he's forgiven them, that he loves them, that he wants them to come back. And so God brings somebody along like Isaiah. And Isaiah comes along and he says, this is what's going to happen. And you're not going to like it. And the enemy's going to come in. And they're going to take you captive. That's on one hand. And then Isaiah says, but God's hand is still outstretched. Like, like look, all, all you have to do is just return. And God forgives. And God welcomes. And God restores. And God picks you up right wherever you're at. Have you been amazed at how God just picks people up no matter where they're at? No matter what their condition, no matter what they've said or what they've done or where they've been, God forgives because of Christ. Isaiah is wrestling with a bunch of people trying to convince them of this truth. That if they're left to themselves, they're going to end up in a condition that is worse than when he first found them. As much as they cried out and were in despair. Don't go that way. You're not going to like it. In the midst of all of that, and Isaiah getting that across to them, comes along this awesome chapter 11 of Isaiah. And you might want to mark it because chapter 11 shows to us the Messiah. You could talk to any Jewish rabbi today and ask him what, Isaiah chapter 11 is about, and they'll tell you it's about the Messiah. And it's about when the Messiah comes and sets up his kingdom. Now we know that the Messiah has already come, first on that mission to die for our sins as our substitutional sacrifice, our lamb. He stood in for us for the suffering that we could not do for ourselves. The holy, perfect sacrifice of Jesus took care of that for us. That was the first time. But this is talking about when he returns. So really, I thought to myself, this is almost as though Isaiah could come here tonight and Isaiah could stand here and talk to us and say, let me tell you what's coming next. Let me tell you what you folks are about to experience. Because Isaiah has this incredible ability to see into the future with total clarity and because it comes from God, every single word of it will be accomplished exactly the way Isaiah said it. Because it comes from God. So it's like reading this is like Isaiah standing in front of you and telling us what's going to happen next. That's, that's pretty thrilling to me, especially when you turn on the news and you see, oh my gosh, okay, never mind, we don't talk about the news. So it's a very exciting chapter i think isaiah the lord through isaiah wants to light up for us that living hope of uh, christ's return and what it will be like so it's kind of like us taking little snippets out of uh, the book of revelation that we've already gone through so we have not yet seen what a god's creation was intended to be and I know some of us here really like sunsets. And <laughs> some of us have never seen a sunrise now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but some of us really love nature. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, you know what? One thing about nature I really enjoy is if, if I'm laying in bed, and even if I'm sound asleep, if it starts to rain, I just love that sound for some reason, you know. Even if it wakes me up, I go, oh, that's way cool. Thanks, Lord. You know, we need that. That's really nice. That happened a few days ago to me. So I was like, what's, what's that sound? And I was trying to figure out what it was, you know, as I was waking up. Sounds like crackling. No, what is that? Then I figured it out that it was rain. Oh, I really enjoyed that. So there's plenty of things of nature to enjoy, right? <laughs> But we have not got the slightest clue what creation was meant to be. I'd like to get with people that think that, uh, you know, creation is, you know, Mother Earth and creation is so glorious. Look, you don't even know. Stick around, give your life to Christ, and you're going to see creation as it was originally intended to be. It gives me this other thought. Then not only do we get a glimpse here of what creation was meant to be like, but it also tells us how horrible sin is. 
because creation would still be perfect the way God originally intended to design were it not for sin entering the world. It was a poison injected into creation. And uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, Paul the Apostle gives this interesting statement. He says that uh, all of creation is, uh, yeah, it groans and travails, but it's on tiptoe in anticipation. There's, some, there's something in a perfect creation that somehow makes it aware that something great is coming. And it's like all of creation is like on tiptoe, like, oh, you think you've seen a sunset? <laughs> you think you've seen a tree? You think you've whatever. It won't compare to what your eyes and what my eyes will see when Christ returns and sets up his new kingdom, establishes things the way he intends it to be. That's what this chapter gives us. Is that a cool chapter? Maybe we ought to read it, huh? Okay, let's do that. Verse 1. <laughs> There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Let me stop right there. There shall come forth a rod that can also be translated a shoot or a sprout. So there's this little sprout that's going to come from the stem. This is talking about a stem like something has been chopped down. And all that's left is the stem. There's no trunk. There's no top. It's like a stump. So the picture that we're being given right here is a picture of kind of this tree that's been chopped down. There's nothing left of it. It's just a stump. But it says here, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is saying that out of the family of King David, and it's saying Jesse, because who, know, who knows who Jesse is? Who's Jesse in regards to David? That's his dad, huh? That's his own man. So Jesse's his dad. Out of that stump, <laughs> and out of it comes a shoot, and the shoot will grow, and it will bear fruit. That shoot, that rod, that stem is talking about the Messiah, Jesus. Do you know that there are actually some, uh, uh, some ancient Jewish writings that quote this? And it says, and in some, in some cases it says, there shall come forth the Messiah from the stem of Jesse. So the Jews know exactly uh, what this is talking about. Uh, another interesting thing about this that I read, uh, let me see if I get this right. The word that's used there for shoot or rod uh, can also be translated branch, but the, the form of the word, the form of that word can also be used to uh, portray uh, a Nazarite. So, who's the Nazarite, by the way? <laughs> Does it, um, uh, Matthew gives us that. And Matthew quotes from this. The Nazarite is Jesus. So it's like, it's so wonderful to get a hold of the Word of God and begin to dig in and see how every single line points to Jesus. It goes on to say, and a branch shall grow out of its roots so out of the darkness of the previous chapters and believe me they were dark uh, shines the light of the messiah jesus the real king you know we talk about kings and rulers and this army and that army hey we've got jesus christ he's the real king the real army amen here's what one commentator wrote we see a bear withered tree stump robbed of its trunk and top and it looks as though the stump will never bear any fruit anymore but a small shoot sprouts up from the root of this dry stump which is part of the davidic dynasty 
Because of its unsightliness and misery, it is not named after David, but after his father, Jesse. When Jesus was born, there was nothing royal about that dynasty. But a new shoot sprang forth from the old stem. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> That's just verse 1. <laughs> verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Shall rest upon him. Notice it's even telling you that the shoot and the and the and the uh, the 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 uh, rod is a him, right? So the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And we just we were just uh, on Sunday talking about John the Baptist, and he saw the Spirit of uh, the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus as a dove and uh, then it goes on to say the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord now right away a lot of people like to dissect all these and tell you all you know just talk about each one of them which is cool to do and I I recommend that you do that but I think what grabs me here is is that verse 2 is a kind of a description of Jesus in his ministry. So in other words, to run into Jesus Christ is to run into somebody who has the spirit of the Lord resting upon him. To run into Jesus is to run into somebody with wisdom. And not just wisdom like I know, but wisdom like understanding not only does he have all wisdom but he understands us and knows our frame and knows what we need it says the spirit of counsel and of might didn't we just go in isaiah 9 6 where it says he's the mighty counselor right and uh, then it says the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord i like it that it puts the fear of the lord on the jesus how do you explain that one? Well, think about it for a moment. What was Jesus' greatest passion that he kept repeating over and over and over again? I did not come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. That was his joy. That was his delight. You know, I only say the things that I hear him say. I only do the things that he does. It was all about living a life to please the Father. What an awesome example for us of what it means to have the fear of the Lord on you. So all of these things can be seen in Jesus Christ. And then as Jesus is alive in us and we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, these things too become a part of us. Another thing that I see here is... Uh, this may surprise you, but you know the candlestick that's in the uh, in the temple, right? <laughs> As you walk in to the temple, what you see first off is this uh, five about a five foot tall uh, golden uh, candle, uh, and it has one in the center, and then then it has three stems on each side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and what we see here is seven. So I see as the middle stem would be the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And then coming out of the sides is the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So that's a picture of Jesus burning bright in his ministry here. And guess what, guys? We're to be like that too with Christ living in us. We're to burn bright with these very same things. Now, uh, I met with somebody uh, uh, from another uh, church asked to meet with me. And uh, we had a wonderful time together. Love this brother dearly. And uh, I was trying to get across to him that uh, you, you don't like get saved and then immediately you're just like you know you're like jesus <laughs> i'm still waiting for that to happen by the way <laughs> that it is a step-by-step -step thing and that even paul the apostle 
uh, at one point said, listen, I have not yet apprehended that for which God has apprehended me. I haven't arrived. But this one thing I do, right? I keep, I keep mushing and moving forward, you know? And that, that, that's how it is for each one of us. That's how it is to be. Uh, I don't maybe you could share this with the church, Mike, on uh, Sunday. Remind me. Uh, I remember Mike did a teaching years ago, and it had to do with uh, 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 bit by bit, here a bit, there a bit, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. Do you remember doing that? Maybe you can share that with the church, that it's, it's the constant, continual exposure to the Word of God, to doing the Word of God, to faithfully moving forward. It's not like this presto changeo thing, super Christian. Wouldn't that be nice? This is a thing that you have to work out with fear and trembling, you know? That's, that's how our faith is worked out, fear and trembling. So all these things are beautiful all these things belong to us all these things are part of the new creation and then the lord works them out through us as we learn to obey him in the fear of the lord submitting our will to his will first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 says that jesus became for us the wisdom of god the wisdom of god it's all wrapped up in jesus christ he is wisdom Jesus lived and ministered as a man, fully man and fully God, with the fullness of the Spirit of God, the wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, and knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Boy, those, those are just run for those things, guys. Jesus displayed in his ministry that it flowed. These things, here's what I find interesting about the Lord. Although all of these things belong to him and his deity, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, these things, these seven things, did not flow from his own character. They flowed from his obedience to the Father. Because he laid aside his deity, his royal robes and he came as a man and he prayed and he felt what we felt experienced what we experienced so all of these things come from and flowed from the spirit of the lord who filled him in every way also these attributes speak of the triunity of god because these seven things can be spoken of of the holy spirit can't they these seven things can be spoken of of god the father they're all in the scriptures and they all coincide. Verse 3 says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge. You got to love this. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. I think we could call, how about this, if we call these first, this first part of Isaiah 11, uh, things I love about Jesus. <laughs> How about that? That's the over category. Things I love about Jesus. And this one I absolutely love about Jesus that he doesn't judge by outward appearance. And he doesn't, okay, it's probably best shown by what we easily do. We easily judge by outward appearance. We easily judge by what we hear. We hear one side of the story and right away we make a judgment. <laughs> without hearing the other side. It's like my mom uh, says, if you just uh, listen to one person, you're only getting one side of the slice of bologna. <laughs> and so, which is interesting, because if you would have listened to the other person and not this person, then you'd have made a judgment based on that. It's, Lord help us. He, he does not judge the way we judge. Aren't you glad about that? He doesn't look on the exterior. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor. Righteousness can be translated as rightness. Or how about this? Right onness. His judgments are holy and they're seated completely within truth. That's how he makes a judgment. And decides with equity for the meek of the earth. 
So those people that are living on the earth, when the Messiah comes back to rule and reign, it seems to me are all going to be meek people. Because the meek people get the equity of God. That's what the rule and reign of Christ is going to be when he returns. The total, complete equity of God in every situation, done lovingly from a God who loves us, created this universe for us to enjoy. Uh, meekness has to do with being humble. I wonder what's going to happen to the proud. Uh, he has a totally different program for them. In fact, here's a little bit of it, the rest of verse 4. He shall strike the earth with, earth with the rod of his mouth. In other words, when Jesus speaks something, it's going to be done. And I think instantly, that's going to be it. He's going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, the correction of his mouth, the justice of his mouth, the righteousness of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Doesn't John give us a picture of Jesus Christ when he returns as having a sharp two-edged sword that proceeds from his mouth? I don't know, I don't know what he's going to say if there are words attached to this when he comes back. I, we're not told in the book of Revelation. I kind of think to myself, he's going to say something like, enough, and that'll be it. Uh, that'll be it. The, the battle of Armageddon really is not a battle at all. It, it's, a, it's an end to all battles is what it is. And Jesus does it with a word from his mouth. This very much right here points to that time, that Armageddon, that, that battle. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, we read, And then the lawless one, that's the Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that that is... And Isaiah just calls it striking the earth with the rod of his mouth. Verse 5 says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. You know, uh, these two things then, righteousness or rightness, and then the other one is faithfulness. Now I want us to... Be excited every time we get to the scriptures and it speaks about the faithfulness of God. <laughs> you want to know why? Because he has promised he will never leave us and never forsake us. And he's faithful. Even when we're not. Even when our hearts are unfaithful. God remains faithful still. So whenever I see the faithfulness of God and where does he wear it? Where does Jesus wear it? right around his way. This is who I am. This is my identity. I'm faithful, which means every single promise that he has said in his word to those who put faith in him is golden. <laughs> every word is true. Every word will come to pass exactly as he has stated it. All right. Uh, when Christ comes back, there's going to be peace on earth. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, that's another thing that I don't think that we know, uh, peace on earth. I don't think that we, I don't think we got that one figured. I don't think we've experienced that, have we? Uh, somebody said, peace on earth is that brief moment where everyone stands around reloading. <laughs> so that, that's what peace on earth is like. But there's going to be an incredible peace on earth. And this peace, this peace is going to be, I believe, I can't think of another word except for palpable. It's going to be a palpable peace. A peace that extends to all humanity. And then a peace that extends to the animal kingdom. And then a peace that extends to the creation. Now, now look, when Christ comes back, we're told in other places in the scripture that the, the trees will clap. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that. Here comes Christ and the trees are just like, <laughs> I, I, 
I'm blown away at what creation was meant to be, and I only have the slightest inkling of how glorious a creation is. It says here in verse 6, oh, but let's put this under, let me give you another heading. The heading is, no predatory animals, and then right next to that, no predatory humans. Next to that, no dangers in creation. See, this is hard to figure, isn't it? This is big stuff right here. But look what it says. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. I don't know if you can picture those two together, but that, that's a little mind-bending in and of itself. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. <laughs> the calf with the young lion and the fatling together. And catch this. And a little child shall lead them. So picture in your mind this big old line. And the little kid just grabs it by the chin, the little hair on the chin of the lion, and the lion cooperates. It's going to be that beautiful. If you've ever seen, uh, you know, every now and then a crazy person will try to hug a panda bear every now and then you hear that you know you're like don't do that because they look so cute i mean they really do have a the other ones that look really cute are uh uh well sometimes bears do right raccoons, raccoons look cute too. <laughs> they'll tear your face right off and uh so do polar bears look really cute right <laughs> but you you're gonna get to hug one Look forward to it. Look forward to hugging a lion. Look forward to walking with a polar bear. Look forward to it. There will be no, that's what this verse 6 says, no danger in creation at all. Verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze. So look, the animal kingdom turns into a grazing kingdom rather than predatory. Their young ones shall lie down together. <laughs> and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Can you imagine looking out your kitchen window? And there's your little one in huggies. <laughs> and there's a cobra's den. Have fun, sweetheart. You know. And the weaned child, so this is like just a toddler, shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's how powerful this is. We have to catch a glimpse and get an understanding of what's waiting for us and of how powerful our God is and how incredible creation is. It's not some accident. It's not random. It was not put here by aliens. God created it. And on account of sin, it is fallen. It is predatory. And that will cease when this palpable peace of God hits the planet with the Messiah showing up. Verse 10 says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who's the root of Jesse? Jesus. Who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. What's that Christmas saying? Wise men still seek him. <laughs> so this is saying everybody is out to get to Jesus. And why wouldn't they be with what they're experiencing because of the eruption of his peace on this planet when he comes back and sets foot on planet Earth? And his resting place shall be glorious. I, I almost tend to think that his resting place is talking about the whole Earth now that he's here. His resting place. There's no more strife. In fact, at one point, we were enemies with God, weren't we? We were enemies. <laughs> but now there's not an 
enmity between us and the Father because of the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this point, there will be no enemy. Satan's bound for a thousand years at this time. There's no enemy. There's no enemy. I think, I, I think we're just going to, I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to be so blown away at this that we're going to, that everybody's going to look at each other and they're going, this is Jesus. This, this is, where is he? How, how do I get there? I, I want to see him. Where, where is he? And it says here that he, Jesus, the root of Jesse, will be like a banner, like putting up a big sign, like a big giant flag. There's like, where is he? I want to go see him. Let's go. <laughs> That's what it's going to be like. It shall come to pass in that day when the Messiah comes that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, uh, and the islands of the sea. This is really talking about any group of people who has ever been an enemy of God's people or taken captive by God's people. And it's saying that it's interesting the way it puts it here. A second time. There is a calling of God that went out uh, 1948 and 1960. There were no Jews in, in there were no Jews. It was just a wasteland then. They weren't even speaking Hebrew back then. Did you know that? They had lost the language altogether. But when they started coming back into the land, they were like, well, let's speak our language. Let, let's speak our language. And since then, Israel is being blessed in so many ways. It's not a wasteland anymore, is it? It's an envy of all the enemies of God's people. And that was a calling of God that is taking place right now. We see people that are wanting, Jews that are wanting to go back to Jerusalem. But when's the second calling? So when Christ returns, when the Messiah returns, and then he's going to say, well, my people come to me. He's going to reestablish the 12 tribes. Some people say, well, we lost 10 of them. That was the northern tribes, right? Turned into the Sumerians, but uh, Samaritans. But, uh, and there was only the two in the south. But uh, God's going to call them back. We're going to see the 12 tribes. Not only are we going to see the 12 tribes, but we're going to see Israel, Jacob there. Jacob with the 12 tribes. Won't that be something? Won't that beat all? Man, I'll tell you, you know what? If, if, the, if the Lord tarries, he doesn't come back while I'm still alive. You come visit me when I'm on my, taking my last breaths. Remind me of what's coming, will you? That's what I want to hear. I want to hear about heaven. And I want to hear about my Jesus. You come and tell me about that if you come visit me. Amen? Verse 12. He will set up a banner for the nations and will gather or assemble the outcasts of Israel. This is the second when he calls them back. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, they even call it the diaspora, don't they? Rome came in. Okay. Rome came in, and they were so mad at the Jews by 70 AD <laughs> that they pretty much leveled the whole place, turned over everything, took anything that was any value, either murdered the people or scattered them out. That was called the Diaspora, where they were all all the Jews are spread out to the world uh, until 1948 with the Balfour Agreement and God calling them back in. That was the first calling, uh, but uh, they were all spread out, and now God's calling them back, and He's assembling the outcasts of Israel, and uh, no one's going to be left out of this, and. Uh, Praise God, I lost my point there. 
<laughs> well, maybe it wasn't that good of a point. How about that? <laughs> uh, and gathered together from the uh, dispersed of Judah from the four uh, corners of the earth. So nobody's going to be left out. God's going to call them all back in. Also the, en the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass uh, Ephraim. That's kind of funny the way that puts that. <laughs> but uh, that's how I know the 12 tribes are going to come back together. Because uh, we're talking about uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And they're not going to be at odds anymore. They're going to become one under Christ. That's how I know they're all going to come back together. Verse 14. But they shall fly down upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Oh, I know what I was saying. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Okay, so... Uh, so Rome was so mad at the Jews because they were so unruly and so hard to to rule <laughs> that they finally came in and wiped them all out and sent them every which way they salted the land how horrible is that they salted the land so nobody could even grow anything there and uh out of anger uh they named they renamed israel on all of the roman maps and they renamed israel to philestria which is taken from their major enemy, the Philistines. So Israel was renamed uh, Philistria, or today, Palestine. And when the Jews were called back into the land, when they started coming back in, they renamed it. They said, we're not Palestine. This is Israel. The land that God promised us. And so they renamed it and started speaking the language again. That was it. Isn't that cool? Uh, <clears throat> anyway, this part about flying down. Okay. Uh, they'll fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines towards the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab and the people of Ammon shall obey them. In other words, uh, the government that Jesus sets up on planet earth when he returns is a government that is, it's Jesus and the Jews and the rest of the world. They're uh, like a ruling government over the earth. What do you think about that? Pretty interesting, huh? The last shall be first, the first last. God's promises to them are solid gold. And uh, so that's, that's pretty darn cool. This is talking in verse 14 about all their enemies. These are the people who picked on the Jews and took advantage of them. By the way, do you know that today you can go to Israel and you won't find any Romans? But what you will find is Jews... <laughs> giving you tours of Roman architecture still left in Israel. Just kind of an interesting little sideline there. I thought of, okay, verse 15. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt with his mighty wind. He will shake his fist over the river, that's Euphrates, and strike it with seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. So, uh, uh, this is going to be along the lines of, uh, you take Euphrates, it's kind of a natural boundary, right? It's kind of a natural barrier. And uh, so what, what the Lord says that he's going to do is he's going to blow on it, and he's going to turn one big giant Euphrates into seven little streams. And the streams are going to be so small that his people, the Jews, can go across it, walk across it, and not even get their feet wet. So that, that's what the Lord's saying he's going to do. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people. These are the ones he's calling back. They, they, they won't have any problem crossing the Euphrates. Just like Egypt, <laughs> when he parted the sea and they walked across on dry land. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as if as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. 
So uh, it's interesting that the Jews refer to that uh, when the Lord parted the Red Sea and then not, not he didn't just part it but he made the ground dry which is that's a pretty good miracle there and they walked across on dry ground so what what the jews have always called that is they call it the highway so god made a highway <laughs> and here he's saying that god's going to do the same thing when he calls his people back there's not going to be any barriers stopping them they just walk right across back into israel so do we have a lot to look forward to? Amen. Kind of, sort of, a lot, huh? It's kind of so, uh, you know, mind-boggling, you know? And I, I can hardly wait. And, and his promises are true. And remember that he's faithful. And no matter what you face now in this wacky world, uh, the one that's coming is so great that it's not even worthy to be compared to anything we might suffer here. And I know life's tough sometimes. I know it's hard. But, but remember what God has saved us from and what God is saving us to is pretty outstanding. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this night. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, and those that watch us online. I just ask a blessing on them, on each one that hears this word as it goes out. Bless them. Encourage our hearts, Lord, with what you have waiting for us. Give us a longing in our heart for those days, and not just for those days, but for Jesus being here with us. Bring that peace, Lord, that passes all understanding to planet Earth. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. For we pray all these things in the name that's above every name, the name at which every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. God bless you all.